Hi, and welcome to York Street's Wednesday Devotions. We hope that this message helps you grow a little bit closer to God, but also picks you up for a bit of a midweek booster.
I was doing some reading this week and found out that sharks have to breathe through their mouth. The water comes in their mouth and they, they get the, the oxygen out of the waters that they need, out of the water that they need, and then it comes out their gills. And that's how they breathe. Now, while many sharks have some bodily mechanisms that will suck the water in, no matter what they're doing, there are a number of sharks, and particularly a lot of Australian sharks, that don't have that mechanism within their body, which means for, their, for water to pass through them, for them to get the oxygen out of the water to survive, they actually need to be moving. And if those certain sharks stop moving, they suffocate and they die. So from the moment that they're born, the shark continues to be moving. We also find that if you're going for a walk, and we're looking forward to the day, I'm sure, when we're able to walk back in the bush and enjoy nature as we know it. If you go bushwalking in Australia, you'll find that if you ever come across a stream, that if it's flowing, that means it's safe to drink. But if it's not flowing... There's some caution around it. Because if the stream isn't flowing, what takes place is any contaminants, any seeds or anything that fall in it start to go mouldy. And because there's no flowing water to wash it away, to take away the impurities and, and to cleanse what falls into the water, it becomes stagnant and it festers and becomes quite dangerous. Our discipleship journey as followers of Christ can be a little bit like that. We are all called to be following God, to be remade in his image on this lifelong journey as lifelong learners, not only of the world that God has given us, but also of who he wants us to be. And I wonder if some of us have fallen into a pattern where we're not growing, Maybe we're a little bit stagnant in our faith. Maybe we're, we're flowing, but it's very slow. Maybe we're moving, but it's not as quick as it used to be. And I'm not talking physically, I'm talking spiritually. And so today, I want to talk about how we can be disciples that are being renewed by the Holy Spirit. And much like a river, those contaminants, the things of this world that drop into us get washed away by the moving of God's word, the renewing of his presence within our life through scripture and through a relationship with him. And likewise, while a river gives life and nourishment, a shark is something to be feared. And when you have God on your side, when you are anchored in scripture and led by the spirit, then the things of this world need to be afraid. Because you should be feared, because when you move, you're moving through his spirit, being energized by his living water. And in doing so, you're something to be reckoned with. So how do we be like sharks and to be feared when the things of this world come against us, but also being renewed with the things of God? Well, a big part of this is something that was highlighted when I was preparing a talk for the local Christian college here in Ballarat. I've been working on a couple of talks for their Christian studies there, and in those talks I've been studying the book of Nehemiah. It's a book that I, I have a great appreciation for, and I actually studied it quite intensely at Bible College. The book of Nehemiah takes place in a time in history where God's people are in exile. They have turned away from God, and God has said, well, I love you, and when you're following me, I am with you. But when you're not following me, I'm not going to hurt you, but I just can't be with you. And so the incredible things that you're doing when I'm with you, I now can't do. I'm not persecuting you. I'm not oppressing you. I'm just taking my hands off and letting the things of this world drop. And while you're stagnant, I'm not going to wash them away. I'm just going to see what happens. I'm just going to take my hands off. And so time and time again through the Old Testament and God's people follow God and cry out to him. He rescues them when they, they're following other gods or following other things and the corruption that takes place and the, the stagnant of their spiritual life starts to come to the surface. God goes, hey, I can't be a part of that. And this takes place. They're in captivity. They're in the, the, the period of exile in the Old Testament. And just a little side note, the, the book of Ezra and Nehemiah then end up being the last books 
uh, in our timeline of the Old Testament, if you put it in chronological, in order of date. They're the last books in the Old Testament before we get to what we believe was Mark in the New Testament, about three to 400 years later, that was written. And this character, Nehemiah, pops up, and he is the cupbearer to the king. So what's his job? What's his task? His task is to check the drink that the king would drink to make sure it's not poisoned and to present the cup. That was his job. That's what he did. Pretty, in some ways, it's a pretty cruisy job. You know, here's the cup, but also you put your life on the line every day in case someone's trying to kill the king. But that was his job. He was a, a, a cup bearer to the king. Nehemiah is this character we see, and in Nehemiah chapter 2, he writes almost like a biography of his own journey, and he reflects uh, later in life on what took place. And we see that Nehemiah has an incredible fear and love of God. His heart actually aches for the things of God, but he also has an incredible respect for the situation that he's in. Now, once again, we see, much like the other stories in exile, Nehemiah is, is a Jew, is a God-fearing person that has been taken into captivity and through his character wins over the king, so much so that very early on in Nehemiah 2, the king says, hey, you don't look right, what's wrong with you? And Nehemiah is able to say, look, how, how can I be okay when my, my homeland has no walls to protect it's, it's cities and bandits are coming and going and the laws are getting broken and there's no control over who comes and goes. And so through the, the story of Nehemiah, we see three things take place. First, Nehemiah had incredible trust in God. He spent a lot of time in prayer and those two things seem to interchange. Sometimes he prays and then he puts trust. Sometimes he trusts, then he prays. And then he acts. He does his part in that. And through that, he goes to the king and says, Hey, king, the king goes, I see you're so troubled because of his character. The king thinks he's a good guy. He's, he's proven himself and he's been faithful and loyal and, and relationally he's got the king on side. And through his prayer with God, God has worked in and through the king and now the king, the captives that have taken God's people away from their, their promised land, are now sending Nehemiah to go back to rebuild the wall with protection, with guards, with materials to, to use the wood and the stone and all of a sudden um, the enemy of God's people is building the wall for God's people and the wall represented you know, protection, isolation, control over who comes and goes and also the, the power of the city and so Jerusalem gets its walls built once again. And so if we see through this, this story that Nehemiah through prayer and trust, was able to act in a godly manner. I wonder what principles we can take from that as we continue our discipleship journey. But before we do that, I want to see, show us that there's a principle, there's a practice in our discipleship journey that is so important that Jesus practiced it time and time again. And it's the, the practice of retreating, the practice of spending one-on-one -on -one time with God. And what do we get out of that? Well, we get prayer, but we also get to trust which will affect our actions as we renew our minds and renew ourselves through the, the streams of living water and become more like God, uh, more like Jesus. We read in Mark chapter 1, verse 35, that very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up. He left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. He got away from the distractions and went to be with his heavenly Father. News about Jesus spread in, Mark, in Luke chapter 5, verse 15 and 16. News about him spread all the more. So the crowds came to hear and to be healed by their sickness. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places where he prayed. Mark 2, 13, once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. And often we see Jesus walking beside the water. He calls his disciples while he's walking beside the water. Mark 3, verse 7, Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake and a large crowd followed him. That seemed to happen quite a bit as well as he went to withdrew and he went to go away. Um, Jesus went out to the mountainside to pray. He spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples in Luke 6, 12 to 13. When Jesus heard about John the Baptist had been beheaded, you know, terrible, terrible news, he withdrew 
by boat to a private and solitary place where he prayed, immediately followed by the gathering of the people where he feeds the 5,000, after which he then prays at a solitary place once again to God before walking on the water. Jesus entered the house in Mark chapter 7, verse 24, and he did not want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence a secret. He was trying to find some isolation. He was trying to find some solitary spaces to be able to pray and, and refocus his life back on the one who gives him life through his Father. It goes on and on and on. So many times Jesus led by example, we see the disciples do the same. So how do we retreat to a solitary place? What do we do? And in today's world, hey, we're all in solitary places, aren't we? We're all stuck at home. Well, I want to say while I'm about to share the the practice that I do when I retreat, uh, I believe that we can actually retreat, maybe not physically, depending on who's in your home. If you're If you're by yourself, then maybe that is an easy thing to do. But if you're home with loved ones, if you've got children, if you're homeschooling, then this is a bit of a tricky thing. While physically you may not be able to retreat, but maybe spiritually, emotionally and mentally, you may be able to find some space to to follow this practice. So what does retreating look like? I want to do a shout out to Larry Galbraith, who showed me a part of this model and I've adapted it and changed it Uh, over the years to suit myself but this is a simple way that I find every time I retreat helps me focus my mind the first thing that always happens when I retreat with God is I find a quiet place I sit there with a journal a a diary and I have a diary that I just use for for retreating and when I can look back and see what God has done in the past I, I take a bible sometimes I take some snacks that's about it and I, and I love to go out in nature. I love it. But at the moment, we, we can't do that as much. So I've gone to coffee shops in the past. Once again, I wouldn't do that at the moment. But just to find a space, it's about finding an uninterrupted space to spend between you and God. Quite often, the first thing that happens, though, is I sit down, and what's in my head? Is, is it godly? No, it's on the way home, I've got to get milk. Uh, I've got to fix the, the paint in the, the bathroom and, and I've got to remember that, that I've got to pick the kids up after school and I've got to do this job and I've got to do that job and church and I've got this tomorrow and I've got to do that and this and, this and all these jobs start going crazy in my mind. I used to start writing them out as a, so I wouldn't forget them and just go, I'll put them aside. But I found a better practice, which was the practice that Larry Galbraith showed me years ago, uh, which once again I've adapted a little bit. But we'll show you what that looks like. The first thing that I, I do in my, my journal is I draw a large circle. It takes up often half the page in my little notebook. And then I turn my circle into this pizza-looking thing. The whole time I'm spending time in prayer saying, God, what, what do you want me to be doing? What, what do you have for me? And then I... I compartmentalize parts of my life, of who I am. I, this is me. I'm, I'm all things all the time, but, but there's areas of me. So, so number one, I'm a, I'm a Christian. I'm a husband. Don't check my spelling. I'm a father. Um, but what am I? I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a staff member, so I'm a minister. I'm, I'm a leader, I'm a friend. Uh, how about my self-care? How am I looking after... How am I looking after myself? That's his care. It's being led by the Spirit, I'm sure. And then I usually have a gap. And in that gap, that last piece of the pie, I, I put whatever pressure is, is the greatest at the moment. And so I would say today, isolation. Now with all of these different parts of who I am, I then give myself a marking out of 10. And, and it's a, a, 
a bit of a health checkup. How am I doing? Now, I'm not going to judge myself on the marking. I'm just going to be true with how I'm going with the marking. Sometimes I'll be good. Sometimes I'll be bad. I'm assuming that some of these in this season will be bad. Why? Well, we're in ice. This is, the world is different. There's some things that, that will be tricky at the moment. How am I at, at being a friend? Well, I'm looking after the staff. I'm trying to look after the church. You know, this is, this is pretty huge. There's a lot of pressure. But for those people that I would naturally spend time with, naturally hang out with, am I following them up? I could do better. I might give myself a 6 out of 10 because I, I could probably do better, but I'm not going to beat myself up because I'm actually flat out because as a minister and as a leader, man, we are pastorally caring for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people every single week uh, within our teams and our ministry. So as a minister, man, I'm going to give myself like a, a maybe a 7 or an 8 because as a church, we are doing some incredible things in the midst of incredible season that no one has ever prepared for, no one's ever lived through this before, making it up uh, through God's willingness as we go. And I go through and I mark myself out of 10. Then I start to say, why? Why am I being an average friend? Well, because da-da-da, and I write some thoughts. Why am I being a good minister? Well, da-da-da-da. Why maybe I'm, I'm not spending as much time in God's word as I should? Well, that's because I'm flat out down here. Okay, my self-care. <laughs> Let's go two. Uh, be, well, I, I'm not doing, it's probably not two, it's probably a little bit better than that. But, well, I, I can't go to the gym. One of my self-care things is good for my, my mental health. I have routines. I'm a routine kind of guy. I usually get up at 5.30, go to the gym, listen to some worship, listen to a, a leadership podcast, get home, listen to some scriptures in the Bible, get to church. At the moment, there's none of that. I'm getting up at, my alarm's still going off early, but it's hard to get up. My root, you know, self-care is a bit different. That's Okay. It's, okay. it's better than two, but it's okay. This isn't about judging ourselves. It's about getting a base part, explaining why, then giving it to God. In each area of your life, saying, hey, as a Christian, God, I am here. Where would you like me to be? And then note some things down on the next part of the page or over the next page. As a, as a, as a husband, as a father, God, I'm... I'm I feel like I'm doing this well, but how can I do better? God, as a, as a, as a dad, as raising children, how am, I, how am I doing this to the best of my abilities? What would you like me to do? And what I find that this practice does is start to focus my mind to the point where I'm not thinking about getting milk anymore. I'm not thinking about doing the shopping. I'm not thinking about the other tasks. Rather, I'm finding myself in a space where I'm finding where I'm at, but I'm wanting to take a step forwards to be more like the person that God wants me to be. I then spend some time often with Scripture. And I'll read maybe one of the the Gospels. I often read the book of Acts. Sometimes I'll read one of the other letters. And in doing that, I'm spending time with God and God will quicken something to me because I'm in a space of growth. I'm in a space of wanting to be better, wanting to be more like the person that God wants me to be. How long does this process take? Well, usually I dedicate an entire day to retreating when I do this. I never know how long it's going to be. Some days I'll be there for four or five hours other days, it's longer. I remember one trip a number of years ago, uh, sitting out on a, on a ledge over a cliff, looking out an incredible valley and just thinking how amazing God is, how small I am compared to his creation. And as I looked out over this huge valley, I'd spent the whole day sitting in scripture and journaling and, and wrestling with God and, and working out what areas of my life I need to work on to, to, to renew and let those living waters flow through me. I'm looking at scripture and letting him speak through that, but also hearing God's voice and, and the convictions of the things that I need to correct in my own life. And I'd been there for a number of hours and it was about three or four in the afternoon and, and it was starting to get dark 
the sun was starting, the clouds were starting to, to come over and, and there was a considerable drop in the temperature and in the light. And all of a sudden, these clouds started to come up from the valley and come up almost over the cliff where I was sitting. And I remember thinking, like, this is my Moses moment. Like, this is, what is what are in these clouds? This is, this is like the holy of holies. Like, God is showing up. And I remember looking at this giant cloud going over, going, is that a rabbit? I don't know. And seeing the next cloud going, oh, it looks a little bit like a dragon. And in my prayer and my spirit, I said, God, what is that? And, and almost heard audibly, God, almost with a giggle, just said, Tim, that's a cloud. And with that, I realized, well, that's time for me to go home. <laughs> if I'm trying to read stuff into clouds, like, that's not there, then, then I'm done for the day. I'm exhausted. I find retreating is an exhausting process, just continually giving it to God, continually wrestling through, but so worth it and so amazing to have those God moments in and through that. How do you know when you're done? You'll know. <laughs> You'll know when you're, you're tired. Sometimes you can retreat and you don't feel, you don't experience it through the, the Spirit. It may be quite a an empty process, and that's okay. You've been obedient. Keep trying, keep going. I remember seeing other uh, staff members from previous churches on the journey of retreating and finding that it was empty for a start until they, they found their, their pattern, they found their niche, they found their way of connecting. For me, that's a great way of connecting. Uh, for others, there's different mediums. For me, I love the nature, I love the bush. Others, they love the busyness of a city. Everyone's different. But how do you encounter with God? What does this change look like? Uh, like Nehemiah, we saw that he was trusting in God and prayer, or praying and trusting, and then acting upon that. And as I was preparing uh, for tonight's message, something quickened to me, and it was a childhood memory. And I grew up in a, a semi-conservative Baptist church. They, they were... Um, they, they were a loving family community within the church but had some sort of walk that fine line between you know, having some hymns and some choruses and, and trying to, to care for the, the wide family within the church uh, but in doing so probably missed as a young teenager uh, totally missed that demographic of kids and, and teenagers as far as the art form but relationally amazing and I remember one Sunday, I turned up to, to church and I was wearing jeans and a t-shirt and, and one of the older members of the church came up and said to me, so, would you go before the king dressed like that? And I remember being shocked as a teenager going, wow, um, probably not, I've, I've never been asked to see the king. And, and, and as a teenager fairly dumbfounded not expecting to be confronted and definitely not having a response and the older gentleman then started saying you know you've come to church to to meet the king and, and you should dress appropriately and started talking about the way that I dressed um, I remember mixed emotions I was angry I was sad I was confused I was not sure what to do I didn't really want to be there um, it was an odd space and, and I was able to sort of shrug it off after a couple of days. Um, and the following Sunday, the same gentleman came up to me, but this time in tears. And he said, I am so sorry. I had no right to say that. I've been reading scripture this week and God has convicted me that how dare I cause a young person to stumble? How dare I confront someone in such a judgmental way? Like, would you forgive me? And I want to say that the thing that stood out while I was frustrated and confused as a, as a young teenager for the first comment, the second comment is the thing that stuck. Here's someone that has actually aligned their life with Scripture, leading with love and grace, and, and leading in a way that actually showed what it was to be renewing yourself in Scripture. I've got to say, the next Sunday I wore a shirt. Um, because I wanted to take on the, the character attributes that I saw in this man, because he lived by example. 
Now, just a little side note. God accepts you just the way you are. He doesn't want you to conform. He accepts you how you are. And as you renew yourself, you become more like him. But the clothes that you have, you don't need to wear a certain sort of clothes to come to church or come before God. He just wants your heart. And what this man showed was exactly that, a beautiful, God-fearing heart. The actions that have been renewed through Scripture. I want to encourage us this week to be people that have owned our faith. So many of us have inherited our faith. This is the way it always was. This is the way I was taught when I was a child. And in doing so, sometimes we, we stop the flow of God's truth, God's character, and God's love through our lives. In doing so, we can become a little bit stagnant, a little bit toxic. Like the gentleman that I spoke about, I didn't want to be at church. I didn't want to have anything to do with Christianity that day because what was coming out wasn't coming out of a place of love. It was coming out of a place of self-righteousness. It was an inherited faith, an inherited characteristic that he'd grown up with. And rightly so, in a day and age, we only had two sets of clothes. Where? The second time he encountered me, he showed the love and grace of Jesus Christ. And I've got to say that that flowed so much more in the character of God than his first confrontation. So this week, will you allow God to flow through you? Will you find some time to reflect on the areas of your life and ask God, how would you change me to be more like the way that you want me to be, created in your image, being renewed, so that when things of this world pop up, I can tell when they're right and when they're wrong because I am as ferocious as a shark that is breathing in you to, to get its nourishment. But also, the things that, that may stick and cause me to stumble are being washed away. Will you pray? Will you trust? And will you act in a way that honours God this week? Let's be true disciples to become the men and women that God wants us to be. Will you be brave enough this week to pray the prayer, God, search me. Search me and take captive those thoughts that are not of you and renew me so that I can change in my thoughts and in my heart, but also in my actions to be more like your son. Thanks for joining us tonight. Pray you have a blessed week and pray that you can find some space to renew yourself, be more like Jesus. Have a great week. Thanks for joining us. Lord, you bless me. Come.